Thank you. Good morning, everybody, and uh, a very warm welcome to you. As we've just been introduced, I'm Louise Hodge, and this is my colleague, uh, Melanie Parks, and we both teach in the English department at Dubai College. And when we were asked what to present, we decided to look at how we develop and encourage independent learning skills um, within our students. It's one of the things at Dubai College that we feel um, that we're sort of quite proud of. Um, at Dubai College, we've, we've consciously, actively tried to create a culture um, of independent learning, whereby our students take responsibility for their own learning, um, and where we hope that they will be fully prepared uh, to meet the challenges of the future once they leave school. Um, independent learning is a process where the learner acquires knowledge by his or her own efforts, um, rather than relying on the teacher imparting their knowledge to the students. And that's what we're really hoping to um, encourage. We believe it's really important for our students to be independent learners um, and the KHDA hold it in similar high esteem as us. Um, in order to get an outstanding at, um, at, for your school, um, you need to encourage independent learners and have independent learning happening within the classroom. Um, we think it's really important that it's an intrinsic part of the, their learning and we've been trying to embed it um, from the early age as well. What we wanted this session to be was useful and, uh, and, and practical. So what we decided to do uh, was to compile our top five favourite activities, strategies that we use as a school um, uh, that we found to be most useful in promoting independent learning. Um, a lot of these won't be new. We can't take credit for these. These aren't our ideas. They're things that we've picked up through teacher experience, <coughs> through professional development. So you may be familiar with lots of them, all of them perhaps, but hopefully it will serve as, as a little reminder of some of the things that you can do in the classroom um, and maybe you'll pick up one or two new ones. So what we've done is compiled our top five um, activity strategies that we feel help promote independent learning within the classroom. So what we decided for the first one, one of the things that we uh, like to do is use question tokens. Maybe this is something that you already use. And they're very simple. You can make little question tokens like the one here, just um, on, on card. You can laminate them if you want them to last a bit longer. And they, uh, you can fill in your name there. And it says, this voucher entitles the bearer to one question. You can distribute as many as you like to individuals, one each to individual students, or you can put them on the table for a group. It's up to you to decide how many. Um, and you, it's a limited number. And what this does is it encourages the students to be less reliant on the teacher and try to be more resourceful about finding out answers to questions themselves. They can use uh, textbooks, they can ask each other, they can think of other ways before resorting to the teacher. Um, and what we have found that this does is it eliminates those silly questions, the ones you're familiar with, particularly <laughs> with the younger students. Do I need to underline it with a pen or pen, you know, with a ruler? Do I use black or blue pen? Those sort of questions. So they've got to really think about whether the question requires the teacher or not. And if um, we found when we use this, particularly with key stage three, if, if they get into good habits of finding out for themselves, then that does promote independent learning. If you don't have time to make the vouchers, you can use anything. I personally tend to, I like to use these little uh, coloured pebbles that the students love these as well. Um, you can use marbles, you can use cubes, you can use anything that you've got in hand and once the students have asked the question, you collect it in. You can use sweets and then if they choose to eat them, well, they don't get to ask a question. You can uh, use a variety of methods there. Okay, um, number four is the activity we call agree or disagree, okay? Um, so the activity um, revolves around four simple signs, really, in my classroom. So strongly agree, strongly disagree, somewhat disagree, and somewhat agree. And you can have these up all the time in your classroom, um, ready for when you want to use this activity. Um, and the task would look a bit like this in the classroom. So the instructions here are to read the following statement, decide how far you agree or disagree with it, Stand next to the sign which best describes your feelings and be prepared to justify your decision. So 
For the novel of Mice and Men, John Steinbeck, which is one of the GCSE texts that we um, study at Dubai College, um, I might have this statement on the board for when the students come in or during the lesson at any point. Um, the students would then position themselves where they, um, to the sign which most um, describes their feelings about it. What we think is really good about this task is um, it promotes evaluative thinking, okay, but more importantly, independent evaluative thinking. I like to get my students to think about their own decisions before sharing it to the class. Um, that way, they can then feedback to... If they don't want to share it in front of the class, they can talk to the person next to them why they did that. Our students love to tell each other why they're on opposite sides of the classroom, and it can create even a debate. But what it can do as well is help clarify opinions. Perhaps students might even move positions after a little while. I've had students go, actually, I've changed my mind now. Can I go to the other side? Um, so, yeah, really good activity to get the students with their independent thinking skills. Um, there are a few twists and tweaks to this. Um, Depending on the task, it might be um, more appropriate to put acceptable or unacceptable, thinking about mora morality issues um, in novels, why a character might have done something in a novel. Um, the students could stand as a continuum, okay, so that we can see how far they agree with it, or just to vote with their feet, just to see where they stand at the beginning of a lesson on a certain topic. Okay. Okay. Coming in at number three um, is an activity that perhaps many of you might be familiar with, which is snowballing. Um, and snowballing is a simplified form of perhaps of the activity that you may know, marketplace, Paul Guinness um, marketplace, which we do think is fabulous, but it's sort of uh, more complicated. Snowballing is easier. And essentially, um, snowballing... It's been proven that one of the best ways for students to crystallise um, information is to teach others. It's one of the known facts. And this snowballing activity is the embodiment of what independent learning is, as it empowers the students um, to be responsible for their own learning. And it changes the role of the teacher from um, imparter of knowledge to facilitator of learner, which is really what independent learning is all about. And the way that snowballing works is it looks complicated here, but it's actually very, very simple. And this is it in its most basic form, and you can adapt it. The students can, uh, for homework, go, go home and independently research whatever the topic is. If you're doing the novel of Mice and Men, for example, it might be that one group goes away and researches the Dust Bowl, another group goes away and researches the Great Depression, whatever it is. They find that information out themselves on one part of um, a novel. Then when they come back to school with that information, they are then paired up uh, and they take it in turns to teach each other. That way it cements the knowledge um, in the person who's got the information's head and also it gives the other student the opportunity to learn from, an, from their peers rather than from a teacher um, in a sort of relaxed one-to-one -one environment so they can ask questions if they're unsure. Then those pairs then join up. So you're sort of creating a, a larger group each time. They pair up with another group and they share their findings again. So this time, and you can, you can adapt it. So this time the person who's just learnt the new information could be the teacher. So they could check whether they have in fact learnt it and passed on that information. Or you can keep with the original pairs and then you hear it again, which obviously repetition would, would cement it. And then as a means of assessing to ensure that the person who's receiving the information is actually paying attention, not asleep, the teacher could um, either, you could either have a quiz um, in a group or individually, or the teacher, um, you could ask the students to write down six things that they have um, newly learnt that day as a means of checking uh, that learning has taken place. And there are various uh, adaptations of this snowballing um, activity. Um, which one is it back? Um, which is, like I said, marketplace, which is a bit more complicated, but works really well. Or jigsawing, where, uh, where groups each uh, are responsible for one aspect, and then you sort of pair, uh, mix and match and pair them up. Um, we find this particularly important for in, uh, developing independent skills because it's collaboration, and students essentially are taking responsibility for their own learning. 
With snowballing or marketplace, it's really important to impress upon the students that their peers' learning is reliant on them doing um, the background research. So they feel a sense of ownership, they feel responsibility, they will be letting their group down if they don't do the work. And we find this tends to really motivate students to do well. Um, if you watch snowballing taking place in the classroom, it's a lovely activity. Every student is actively engaged. There are no passive uh, learners. It's busy. It can often be quite noisy, but there's learning taking place. And the role of the teacher is simply supervisory or um, organisation. The teacher can just walk around. The teacher takes a back step and uh, the students are all involved in, uh, in their own learning. And it does work really, really well. Okay, um, what we found at DC is that um, we need to make our students um, intrinsically motivated in order for them to be independent learners. So um, when we were sort of collecting, sorry, no. sorry, so collecting some of the activities, we realised a lot of these were sort of little short activities that you could use as starters, progress checks during the lesson. Um, but they're activities to whet the appetite. Um, and to create that intrinsic learner, that intrinsically motivated learner, and one that wants to be independent and wants to go away and um, make those independent decisions. Um, a lot of these ones also are based around questioning, we found. Um, so uh, questioning in a way that um, really stretches the students. Um, so independent thought again, but they can be questioning, it can be a two-way thing between the teacher and the students, or between their peers as well. Um, so a quite a simple one at the top there, what's the question? Students could walk into an answer on the board rather than a question. Um, and students will, for example, Romeo is the answer. Students start to think, what's the question then? What, what is my teacher asking me today? Is it, um, is it Juliet's um, partner? Um, is it Mercutio's cousin? Okay, so um, they start to, and they start to actually try to outdo each other with the questions, and um, you know, the, again, that promotes that evaluative thinking. Um, ordering activities, um, Diamond Nine in particular is an effective one. Getting again that evaluative thinking, ordering where they they think um, what is most important. Okay, whichever topic it may be. Um, the mystery object to whet the appetite, if you're starting a new topic, um, if it's a new book, um, perhaps having that mystery object on the table, getting the students asking the questions again. Who might um, own this hat? Who might have, a, uh, who might have used this um, little vial of poison here? Okay? Um, so yeah, just getting the students asking questions again. We like to use post-it notes. Um, very, very simple. Um, five things you know about Shakespeare, five things you think you know, five things you want to know. Again, independent thought, but to whet the appetite. Actually, I do, I want to know this about Shakespeare, I'm, I'm not sure about that, okay? Um, and who am I? One that I've used quite recently, um, where the students get so many questions to ask the teacher um, who they're thinking of. So I was doing a a spy topic, um, and the answer was James Bond, um, and they had to ask me questions. They only had so many, so they had to think carefully about this. Um, but again, that wetting that appetite. We create learners who are intrinsically motivated that way, and it is an effect in which you know, they want to go away and learn, and they want to um, do more to learn about the topic. One of the things that we um, have been developing recently and that we are most proud of um, at Dubai College is our debate society. And I know that debating in Dubai is um, becoming more and more popular. Um, and we feel that this really encourages independent learning. Uh, debating strengthens a whole host of skills, including synthesis of knowledge from various sort of curriculum areas and subjects, um, an increased awareness of global concerns, uh, current affairs, topical issues. Um, it also um, improves the skill of public speaking and confidence. It's collaborating. Students have to articulate their own opinion um, on a range of topics. And we have found this um, really, really uh, useful. Um, now, 
our debate society at school is an after-school activity. We do also do debating within our English lessons as well, on both formal and informal levels. But our debate society essentially runs itself. We, uh, Ms. Parks and myself, are responsible for it. But the students are, are now at the level where they are teaching each other's our sixth formers, offer master classes in debating because many of them have, have gone on to be part of the, the UAE national te team and they come back and help our younger students. Our year nine and ten students are helping our, our, our new debaters in year seven and um, we, we're encouraging our students to act as judges, as mentors, as well as involved in the debating themselves. And um, uh, students offer feedback, they, they give targets, and so the, the debate society is one that's going from strength to strength with students taking on greater responsibility and really we've found with us taking less responsibility which is essentially what we're trying to um, encourage. We have just got a short uh, video clip here of um, one of our debating sessions after school. You can see it's just set up in a classroom. It doesn't require a great deal of input. And these, uh, the students have actually just finished a debate. And these are, uh, some of those are year uh, 10 students with uh, year 8 students who were judging and offering feedback. So we just, it, it's, not a, it's not staged at all, it was just a really short clip to show you how our students are now taking on the role of teacher and giving constructive feedback, setting targets for their peers. Okay. So we'll just show you. And so what happens is now that the, the three teachers who run the debate society, we're now free to move between the classrooms. So whereas, uh, you know, uh, last year and, and the year before, we very much were the judges and we could only watch those six students that were debating. Now we've got students judging and so we get to see everybody debate. We can flit in and out between the debates and we get an overview of who our, um, you know, who our strong debaters are, who needs a little bit of help. And it's really, um, it's working out very, very well for us. So that's one of the things that we feel most um, develops independent learning. So that's our top five. Um, but what we really wanted to end with was um, what the students say about independent learning. Um, so we grabbed a couple of students <laughs> in from the end of the day when they finished their lessons um, and asked them three questions um, just to see what they thought about independent learning and how they, how they viewed it. Just this is Jamini and Gisu in year eight. I think it's, yeah, is it you just go down. One? Is it that one? It's there, look. Oh, sorry. That's right. Okay. Okay, girls, can you tell us, um, what do you think independent learning is? Learning using your own resources. Yeah, using the things around you and without teacher's help. Not immediately going to a teacher and asking them being resilient and trying to find out things by yourself. Yeah, so determination and using your friends and your books and the internet before you go and ask a teacher um, about what you do. Okay, Becky, can you think of any examples where you use independent learning at school uh, in any subject on a daily basis? Um, in in languages, when yeah. you have to translate a paragraph and you haven't been directly taught something. You have to use a dictionary as well. Yeah, to use a dictionary, to use the internet, and um, yes. Okay, and, and last question, can you tell me why do you think independent learning is important? Because it's the 
because when you're older, you're not going to have someone to always ask yeah. what to do. Yeah. You're not going to have someone behind you to yeah. tell you what to yeah. do. Yeah. You, can't, you can't rely on anybody to do anything for you, so it's kind of important you do it by yourself. Thank you. Um, yeah, so they really cemented what we thought we were finding out as well. Um, what's really nice is um, they also had those ideas about how they can look, look at books for information and ICT for information, which was also in the, in the, the KHDA outstanding category as well. Um, it was only yesterday I was saying to my year nines that um, to try and find out, you know, first it's brains, then it's your buddy, then it's the books, and then it's your boss, okay? So try and find those different portals for information. And actually, they added in browser as well for, for the internet. <laughs> um, so, yeah, thank you for listening to our presentation. Um, like I say, they're, they're not brand new ideas, but we hope that they might have been a refresher for you. Um, any questions? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Back to the idea of passive learners and active learners, and, and, and this no bowling process. It don't, what you said uh, actually is mind blowing. But uh, don't you think that the bulk of the job is going to be carried out by only the high achievers? No, we find that isn't the case, that everybody takes a role because each person is responsible for finding out one section of information. So they haven't got to find out everything there is to know about the context of a particular book. They're just responsible for their one part. So they take responsibility for that. And they, if, you, if you do this over time, they, they get to realize that they'll be letting their team down, their group down. If they don't have that information, then their group's going to be missing something. And, and students are quite critical and harsh on each other. And if they don't have that information ready, the first time they certainly will the next time because their group will you know won't be very happy with them so no we find it works really well and um, they learn better from their peers than, because they want to than, than from us and as the teacher you've got to think about how you're going to group the students as well in, in with mind of knowing your students who's going to be you know taking a leading role who's going to be carrying who if you like um, they might they yeah. might take one topic per group wouldn't they and yeah snowboard. sometimes you can do that give the, the whole no, not with snow. You'd have to give them individual ones. Oh, yeah. It's they can. Like each, each yes. Each yes. Or you could do it in pairs. I think it's, uh, it works beautifully because if you have a singular topic, for example, if you're doing um, informational text with them in English and you choose a certain topic like plants or a certain animal, uh, there will be various aspects related to that animal. And you don't want, uh, it's very difficult for children to take the entire information alone. So you divide, so you divide the topics between the students in different each groups. Group. And each group contributes information. Yeah. I think so the, the jigsaw works beautifully. Yeah. Jigsawing is great it, as well. It creates expert groups in certain areas. And then those expert groups go back mm. to their groups and they teach yeah. their group yeah. mates. So it's, yeah. it's, uh, and, and with Marketplace, the teacher can provide the information as well. Um, I do a nice activity with my year sevens with an introduction to Shakespeare. And I have these big laminated sheets. So I've got the information about Elizabethan theatre or about uh, Shakespeare's life and times or about, about the Globe Theatre. So the teacher has that information. So you could do that rather than making it homework. If, you th if you've got students who you think perhaps are not going to go away and do the research, you could have a lesson first first where you you provide the information the student obviously is responsible for reading through it for making notes for becoming um, the expert on that topic and then the following lesson you then start to do the jigsawing or the marketplace or the snowballing so you could do it in class if you think they're not going to do it outside Uh, I, I, we would, yeah, generally mix, mix them. Have, mix them. Uh, yes, mixed ability, mm. mixed gender groups. I think, think that works best. To mix abilities in a group, or like you should only keep underachievers in one group and high achievers. In one I think group. for group activities. I think that now, this is what I hear. Like they are calling for this. Yeah. Uh, 
Personally, I think for group activities, it's good to have, have a mixture in there because then your, uh, your, your more able students can take responsibility for directing and sort of cajoling the others. And um, perhaps the, the sort of less uh, able students can learn from those that are more able and they also feel perhaps they need to raise their level in order to keep up. Um, otherwise, the danger of having um, groups that are ability grouped is you may have one group yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think the students that they're not stupid. I think they know if they're in a group and they are the lowest achievers. I think they know that. They think, why should I bother? But I think if you mix them up, you're also often low achievers tend to be those that perhaps aren't behaving particularly well as well. So mm -hmm. I think it raises standards. But that's it. I mean that is up to the individual teacher. Yeah. into the group yeah. and if that task isn't done yeah. then the whole group is not going to be able to present the rest Absolutely. of the class. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's not about grouping them all, it's about every single member of that group having a responsibility. Contributing. Yeah. Yeah. Together. Yeah, yeah. And, and I've done it before where and you the, the teacher does a quiz at the end and then sometimes there'll be a question and the whole group will say what and they'll say that was in your but you didn't tell us that <laughs> and, and so you know they do feel a sense of responsibility for yeah. their whole group oh yes and they love competition I mean we all know that absolutely mm. yes <laughs> little prizes for the group that does the best because everybody contributes. But that's why as well you need to mix the ability so that each group has somebody that's going to need a little bit of support and each group has somebody that's going to take leadership and control. And, um, but if each group has that, then you've got an even playing field. Mm -hmm. so the differentiation in this would be the task that you're not doing Yeah, I've done it like that before. Um, I've given sort of, going back to my SMM again, I've given when it's groupings, I've given different groups sort of harder topics to go with or there's more information to find out. Um, like your one where you gave them information about Shakespeare, I provided the information. They've had to synthesise it, they've had to reduce it down into a short presentation to the rest of the class. Um, so you would differentiate like that, but as well as your groupings. Uh, exactly, yes, yeah, it works really well. They know that they're going to be responsible for teaching it. And it's lovely to watch a class that's involved in one of these activities because they're all busy. There's everybody, like I said, they're quite noisy sometimes. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's um, you know, there's a lot going on. They're busy and there's sometimes movement between the classes, but they are all actively engaged in their learning. There's nobody just sitting back, falling asleep because the teacher's talking. And that's really nice to see. Yeah. Last, last. Sure. <laughs> What, what do you think here, basically, the role of the teacher is going to be? Just observe? Facilitator. Facilitating. Definitely. <laughs> I think that the role of the teacher so will what, never what be redundant. Of, sorry. What, what, what kind of reaction and information uh, students are going to have from the teacher? What? Um, I think, I think often um, the teacher isn't the person that knows all the answers or, um, to a question. You are the person that enables the, the students. And I actually think you are aiming to get to a place where you don't know the answers anymore for them. And then you go, well, you, do you know what? You're an A-level student now. That's probably an area I haven't done. You, you go off and find that yourself. I'll have a look over it. Um, but that's the point where you're getting to. So you facilitate them to that point. You embed independent learning skills. You motivate them with your subject. And then you get them to a point where they're even better than you. And I think the role of the teacher is changing. It's not, we're not becoming redundant, but I think perhaps often we're responsible for, for gathering some mm. of the information at the beginning that you know, we could lay out on the tables yeah. or organizing. And then in the actual lesson, the teacher takes a step back and kind of is able to sort yeah. of float between the groups. Um, I think when you have collaborative learning, just to add to that conversation, when you have collaborative learning class classrooms, I think the role of the teacher is more of making sure that nobody is ridiculed, mm -hmm. yes. and everybody gets a chance, mm -hmm. and that whatever information is being followed through is the correct information, <coughs> and it's moving in the right direction, and that not uh, you know, there's no intimidation inside yeah. the classroom. I think that is where yeah, the positive. teacher's role really yeah. is. It has to be very strong to facilitate yeah. mm. smooth flow of, you know, whatever is happening inside the classroom. Mm -hmm. uh, what could be the ideal 
this training for, for classroom for this kind of, uh, uh, of activities to work effectively? Sorry, could you repeat that? What would be the ideal strength of the classroom? Students, number of students. Oh, so what we do. What activities to work effectively? Mm, I, I, like five groups, six, ten. So I mean, it, we're, we're, we're quite fortunate at Dubai College. We have quite small classes. So within my, my classroom is organized and I have um, five uh, tables set up. But I do change that depending on the nature. Um, I think it's a whole class, I think, depending on the number that you've got in a class. I tend to... But if uh, the students are engaged on a task and they're getting on with it, I think it could get larger and you know that they're getting on with it because they have that responsibility, mm. couldn't it? And also you could always, if you've got a larger class, you could always just sort of divide it into two. So yeah. you've got the same thing. You could still have five groups, but you could also have another five mm. groups. So I think it, it doesn't matter how many, uh, how many people you've got. If they're all involved then it shouldn't be, yeah, shouldn't be a problem. Okay. okay um, we'd be really grateful if you could fill out our feedback forms that we've brought today. Um, just a, for an, <laughs> a minute or two. Um, thank you for listening again. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.